No mic. No. So I'm going to talk about um, some uh, theoretical work about learning and deep linear networks. Uh, so deep learning has enjoyed a bunch of recent successes in a bunch of different domains. Um, but these methods are still something of a black box. And it's really the thing that makes them powerful, the fact that they're a bunch of nonlinearities composed together is also what is exactly what makes theory difficult for these networks. And so in this talk, I'm going to be trying to uh, take a theoretical perspective. So it's not directly aimed at um, achieving better performance, although we'll kind of get there at the end, but we're really interested in these uh, basic questions to help our intuition. How does training time scale with depth? Um, how do the optimal learning rates scale with depth? Uh, and how do weight initializations change how fast these systems um, learn? Okay, so a deep network is a structure like this. You have these complicated nonlinearities, F, at every layer. And that's really what's hard about doing theory for these things. So we're going to take a very drastic approach and just cut out all the nonlinearities. So it's completely linear. Um, and you're probably thinking, OK, well, didn't you just make it trivial? Because um, you can just take the, all we're doing is multiplying white matrices together. It's completely linear. You can just rewrite it as one matrix, W total. And that's definitely true. However, when you're doing learning, you're doing learning on some loss function, which is nonlinear. And in fact, the gradient descent dynamics are nonlinear. And they're coupled, and they're non-convex. And that's, that's the equation down there. And so that's what we have to solve. So deep linear networks, they're not going to be practically useful. They're not going to be useful for studying representational power, right? how the nonlinearities contribute to um, better performance. But they could be useful for studying learning dynamics. That's what I'm going to be talking about. OK, so just to show you that they can do some interesting things. This is a nonlinear network. Oh, uh, sorry, a linear, linear network, deep network, learning on Edmus. And you can see it uh, shows phenomena that we sometimes see in nominee networks. In particular, it sits there for a while doing nothing before the training error starts to drop down. And you can see it's got some other little uh, bumps along the way. And another phenomenon that it shows is uh, faster convergence from pre-trained initial conditions. So again, these are just linear networks here, but that red curve now is after doing auto-encoding pre-training. You can see that not only does learning go faster, it, it beats the, uh, the random initial conditions even you know, counting for training time. And so that is what I'm trying to understand. We're building intuition for the nonlinear case by understanding where this behavior comes from in the linear case. OK, so let's start with three-layer dynamics. I'm just going to have a, the simplest um, deep network you could think of. It just has two weight matrices. And it's fully linear, so the network just multiplies input by those two weight matrices. And we're going to train it on a set of patterns. Your x's are inputs, the y's are the outputs. We're doing batch gradient descent on squared error. Just the simplest setup we can come up with. And that gives rise to these two uh, coupled and nonlinear uh, differential equations. So this is what we have to solve. And the only way that the training patterns enter these equations is through these input correlation matrices and the input output correlations. And for this talk, I'm just going to set the, assume you've wiped in the data. So take the input correlations out. The, the paper has more more general case. All right, so what happens um, in this system? Well, first we can talk about what happens if you run the system to convergence. Just run it forever. And that's been known for a long time. Uh, if you run it to a convergence, then the weights just converge to the input-output correlation matrix, which you can decompose with the SVD, um, which will be uh, relevant in a second. And so there's, there's a simple endpoint, and we know where we're going. But how do you approach that? So you can approach it in a very interesting way, uh, it turns out. And so what we've been able to do is find a set of exact solutions for particular initial conditions that describe the entire trajectory. So um, here's how it works. Uh, eventually, the network is going to come to represent the SVD of the input-output correlation. So it's the top n components where n is the hidden layer size. Um, and essentially what the network input output map is doing is learning those singular values. So as over time these singular values are increasing as a time dependent um, singular value solution where the increase is according to that particular function A up there. And I've plotted it down there. You can see it's just sort of these sigmoidal bumps where um, you start at a low effective singular value strength in 
rise to the correct center of value strength for the data set. And, and this is all for a special set of very balanced decoupled initial conditions. Okay, so one thing we can do with this is um, just talk about learning time. So how long does it take to learn one particular mode? Well, it turns out it's proportional essentially to one over the size of the singular value. So this is a very intuitive result. It says if your input-output math has a very strong correlation, you learn that faster in roughly proportional time. And on um, the other side here, what I'm showing is the fact that, so I, I mentioned that these are from special initial conditions, but if you just run from random initial conditions, um, it turns out that the solutions rapidly decouple. So the red lines here are from simulating a network with um, full random initial conditions. You can see that the analytic solutions are still reasonably good approximations. Okay, so each mode is learned in time 1 over s, and the singular values are determining the learning speed. Um, now what about deeper networks? It turns out we can take the same approach, also use it in deeper networks, and now each effective singular value is evolving according to a more complex differential equation, which I put in here. Um, and one thing that we get from this is the combined gradient, to sort of sum up the gradient contribution we're getting from all the layers. Uh, that combined gradient is order of the number of layers, right? So um, that, will be, that will be relevant later. Um, and so what we really like to know is how learning time changes as we uh, increase the depth of the network. And um, to do that, we also need to know what the optimal, like the largest stable learning rate is, because we can't just pick any learning rate. And so we're going to estimate that using the inverse of the maximal I value of the Hessian. And that gives us an optimal learning rate scaling of 1 over n. Okay, so now we're in a position to answer um, a key question in uh, deep learning theory, I would say, which is how much slower is a really deep network than a shallow network? Is it infinitely slower? And you might think it's infinitely slower because the learning rate scales is 1 over n. But in fact, uh, the time difference for a deep network versus a three-layer network remains finite. So a, a deep linear network can be only a finite time slower um, if you have, at least if you have these special initial all right, so what's the intuition for this? It's a very simple intuition. The gradient norm is of order number of layers. The learning rate is one over the number of layers. So you multiply the two, the learning time is approximately constant. Okay. And so learning can be fast with the right initial conditions. And we wanted to go check this, so we did some experiments on MNIST. These are depths ranging from 3 to 100. 100 is you know, really seriously deep. Uh, and we did 1,000 million units. And uh, it's the exact setup of the equations I showed you before. And you can see that the learning times do look like they're saturated. So it's not like they're division from infinity. They're sort of nicely behaved as the depth scales up. And we get the predicted 1 over n scaling on the uh, optimal learning rate. So we were carefully optimizing the learning rate for each, each depth here. OK. So just the midway summary, the deep linear networks, um, they do seem to have non-trivial learning dynamics. And uh, we can say some things about them. So uh, each mode is learned in time proportional to 1 over the size of the singular value. Um, and uh, optimal learning rate scales is 1 over n. And in fact, these things can learn reasonably quickly, provided that you have these special decoupled initial conditions. And so uh, the question we're going to turn to now is how do you find these good decoupled initial conditions? And you may have anticipated the answer. Um, one suggestion um, from this work is, well, maybe pre-training is helping you do this. So here's an example of non-linear nets um, and comparing it to deep linear networks. Uh, we see a pre-training advantage, uh, optimization advantage in both cases. So maybe maybe that's what would be a good way to find these fast decoupled initial conditions. OK. So what does pre-training do in a deep linear network? Well, it's super simple. All it does is it sets each weight matrix to be a So it's almost, it's almost trivial. Uh, and what that also suggests is, well, instead of doing the pre-training, maybe you could just use a random orthogonal matrix. You don't have to even bother doing the pre-training. So um, I tested that. And here we're comparing to carefully scaled random initial conditions, which do work much better than using unscaled random initial conditions. It's a big win. But if you use orthogonal matrices, it turns out that you get this depth-independent running time. It's always very fast, even up to a very deep network. 
Um, and the pre-trained initial conditions are hiding behind that red line. So they're, they're performing very similar to the profile. Okay. So now, why is this? Um, why is using a carefully scaled random matrix different from using a random orthogonal matrix? And here's the intuition. It's that if you're using a carefully scaled random matrix, you're preserving the norm of a random vector on average. All right? But it's only on average. So here I'm plotting the singular value distributions of the total weight matrix from input to output as I increase the depth of the network when I initialize it with carefully scaled random weights. And as you can see, it's actually it's, all the singular values are not at one. Right? One would mean that um, all, all directions are uh, preserved. But in fact, you get a lot of singular values in zero and a very small number, a heavy tail, that are very large. So you're attenuating on a subspace of high dimension and you're amplifying on a subspace of low dimension. So um, this is throwing away information on a lot of dimensions that you're input, even though it's preserving the normal on average. Whereas if you initialize with orthogonal matrices, it doesn't matter how deep the network is, all of your singular values are exactly one. So perfect asymmetry. Okay. So um, we think that explains why these orthogonal matrices are doing better. And that suggests that um, you know, maybe this idea of isometry might be useful to port over to initializations for nonlinear networks as well. So in particular, um, what would be a good initialization? Well, maybe a near isometry on a subspace of as large dimension as possible. What does, what does that mean? It means if you took the end-to-end decoding -end of your deep nonlinear network, you want as many singular values of that to be concentrated on one as possible. So that means the inputs are faithfully propagating outputs. It's also related to back propagation of gradients. It's kind of the same thing. Um, and we're going to try a really simple approach to get this. We're just going to scale a random orthogonal matrix. Right? So before we just literally used a random orthogonal matrix, but now we're going to multiply it by gain g. And um, it turns out that if you use a gain of g that's slightly greater than 1, so beyond the edge of chaos, if that's called, then you can essentially counteract the contracted nonlinearities, and you do get a lot of singular values that are clustered around 1. If you use a gain of exactly 1, the contracted nonlinearities are hurting you. And if you use a gain of less than 1, then it's really hurting you. Uh, it's it's uh, going to take a long time to train. But this region where you're scaling by just a little bit more than 1 seems like a normal. So, um, to go test this out, we trained um, 30 layer nonlinear networks. This is on MNIST again, uh, 10H networks, softmax outputs, 500 units a layer, and no regularization. So, uh, again, this is not gunning for performance, it's more gunning for does this uh, initialization actually speed up training. And uh, we've compared uh, a number of options here, and indeed, what we see is this initialization with orthogonal weights. It's scaled up slightly above one, uh, actually trains much faster, there's much lower training error, and it also uh, that translates to a little bit of improved test error. So, uh, to summarize, um, deep learning networks have interesting dynamics. It's complex, even though the input output map is simple. Uh, we've been able to show some exact solutions for these dynamics that answer some interesting questions like the learning time skills the overall scale of the combined gradient, optimal learning rates, and this uh, perhaps counterintuitive result <coughs> that deep networks can in fact learn quickly, provided you start with these two couple of initial conditions. And I've also shown that there's uh, this property, dynamic isometry, uh, that it seems to enjoy depth independent learning times. Uh, and essentially the suggestion here is um, to replace a random matrix with a random orthogonal matrix as your initialization step, and possibly to scale that up slightly above one, that might lead to um, faster conversions. And with the last little bit of time, I just want to show you, this is, this is hot off the press, but I thought it was interesting, so I wanted to show it. Um, turns out that very deep networks with even larger gain factors, this is saying just take your other matrix and multiply it by two, or five, or ten, or some large, large scale factor, um, causes deep networks to learn incredibly quickly. So you can train these things in just a few iterations, actually. Um, but there's this interesting uh, test error performance that you pay 
So I think this is an interesting direction for future work. We can possibly understand this even in the linear case. Um, why do we see this divergence between there and the test there? And I think this might provide some of our intuitions. It suggests that small initial weights are an important regularization for smoother functions. That's why um, the test there is rising with a large gain of G. And it also suggests that maybe training difficulties arise predominantly from saddle points rather than local minima. So it's not really that you're getting stuck to local minima. You can train this thing very, very quickly. The problem is you had to initialize it with small initial weights, which meant that the learning time is very slow because you were the nearest side point. So, so we can find some there. Thank you. Yeah, I assume that for this talk, it's actually not a problem. Um, the details are in the paper, and essentially what you do is you just need a weight matrix where it's SBD has only ones or zeros. Um, and so you sort of have the product of two the five matrices. But it all, it all works out. So I should mention the hidden layer sizes are not constrained. They're over complete, under complete. Yeah, that's that's an interesting suggestion. Um, I think I think that could be that could be the case. Yeah. So you know, another direction of future work is we have a lot of different schemes for adjusting learning rates. You might be able to look at those out of grad, uh, etc. In this context, to see how they behave. Uh, do you learn the final rates of your softmax the last layer in the same way, or do you initialize them the same way? Because the scale of that final matrix is also related to the temperature of your softmax and might really affect the way your your That's interesting. Uh, I haven't. Yeah, we do initialize it the same way. So we initialize that. Yeah. Thank you. Do you also want to analyze also during training, or do you just initialize your do you think that it would be good to keep the that constraint in the training? It's an it's an intriguing proposal. So I think uh Pasha Pangio has some work suggesting sort of explicitly enforcing this dynamic assignment for Dan Kim. Um maybe particularly helpful for the current motors. I I think it's it's worth trying to manage right What are your what are your thoughts on uh, you said that this is that the uh, Jacobian of the overall weight matrix? Is somehow related to back propagation with gradients. And that's a big problem for training deep recurrent uh, neural networks. But the long short term memory architecture, for example, gets around that. Does your theory have anything to say about the LSTM architecture? Um, I don't think I'm familiar enough with it to say. It's an interesting question. Well, I have an answer. Oh. It only provides a single value of one for the. the uh, one part of the Jacobian, which is the, the self loops, and so it does. It goes partway towards achieving what they're looking for, but it doesn't do it completely. Yeah, maybe another comment just to put out there is the problem of vanishing gradients is absolutely a problem in these deep linear networks. So that is one thing that's in the deep linear network as well as in the deep linear network. It's not just a fire that's not linear. Okay, let's start. Thank you, Andrew. Again.